All right, I think we're all here. So hello, everybody. My name is Bo Ingman. I'm the president and founder of Pace Equity. Welcome to What's Next in Commercial Real Estate in the Economy, presented by the C-Pace Alliance. This is a timely um, webinar, as there's a lot of volatility in the commercial real estate development market on both the demand side with our clients and the capital supply side as we try and securitize these assets. So there's a lot of volatility we're all working with, and this is just really timely. We're really grateful for Mark for being here. First thing, I'm going to introduce Cliff Kellogg, the executive director of CPACE Alliance. Cliff? Hello, everybody. Uh, I just uh, wanted to say two, um, two things. First, I wanted to say an enormous thank you to PACE Equity and especially to Bo for inviting Dr. Mark Zandi today and Tricia Baker for arranging the all the logistics. And secondly, I wanted to mention that the next CPACE Alliance webinar will be on the topic of the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, that webinar will be held in late October, so look for news on that and other webinars in the future. Back to you, Bo. All right. So Pace Equity is happy to sponsor this event. We're welcoming Mark Zandi as our speaker today. Um, I've had the benefit of knowing Mark for over 10 years and, uh, and heard him speak many times, and I think he's the best in the business, um, and I mean that. So let me give my formal bio reading of Mark, so pardon me while I read. So Mark Zandi is a chief economist of Moody's Analytics, where he directs economic research. Moody's Analytics, a subsidiary of Moody's Corp, is a leading provider of economic research data and analytical tools. Dr. Zandi is co-founder of Economy.com, which Moody's purchased in 2005. Dr. Zandi is on the board of directors of MGIC, the nation's largest private mortgage insurance company, and is a lead director of Reinvestment Fund, one of the late nation's largest community development financial institutions, which makes investments in underserved communities. He's a trusted advisor to policymakers and often on TV and all the networks opining about different economic events in, in, that, in those moments. He's the author of two books and is the host of Inside Economics Podcast. So as we're going, feel free to put your questions in the Q&A and we'll ask them at the end. And with that, over to you, Mark. Thank you, Bo. It's uh, really a pleasure to be with you. And uh, thank you for uh, the and Pace Equity for the opportunity to uh, be on today's call. I should just preface, I'm in the Capitol. I just was... Uh, speaking to con uh, some Congress folks, and they have buzzers going off, I think, for alerting people to vote. So if that's what you hear, that's what that is. We'll just ignore it. Pretend like they're dog speaking or, or barking. <laughs> okay. Uh, my, uh, my sense is that uh, you have a, a number of uh, questions uh, that are top of mind that you'd, you'd have for someone like me, an economist. Um, uh, probably first up, uh, are we in recession? A lot of debate about that recently uh, in the context of the decline in real GDP. That's the value of all the things we produce in the first half of the year. So uh, are we in recession? Um, sorry, there's the buzzer. I apologize. That, that goes off, I think, five times and then it'll stop. Um, hopefully that's not a fire alarm because uh, I'm in the bowels of the Capitol. So <laughs> I don't know how to get out out of here. That would be so a anyway, problem. Yeah. yeah anyway, uh, second question is um, okay. Uh, regardless of whether we're in or without recession, are we going to be still be in recession, or will we go into recession in the next, say, six, 12, 18 months through the end of twenty twenty three, going into twenty twenty four, and uh, and then if we go into recession, how bad is that going to be? Um, you know, are we looking at something as severe as the financial crisis or what happened to us when the pandemic hit, when we lost 22 million jobs in a couple of months or something less severe than that. And then finally, you know, what things should I be looking at to gauge, uh, you know, which path we're going down here? Are we going to avoid recession or, or are we going uh, into recession? And I'll talk, uh, I'll answer those questions and look at it uh, through bringing commercial real estate housing uh, along the way. 
Okay, question number one, are we in recession? And uh, you can move to the first slide, uh, Trish. Um, on, on the suspense, the answer is no. Uh, and I state that with a high level of confidence. You know, I opine about many, many things, some of which I'm confident in, some not so much. This is one of those things I'm very confident. Uh, yes, GDP did decline uh, in the first half of this year. Uh, 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 and historically, that's been a, a pretty good uh, rule of thumb for gauging recessions. <clears throat> but at the end of the day, recessions are determined by, here in the United States, by the uh, Business Cycle Dating Committee of the National Bureau of Economic Research, a group of academic economists, nonpartisan economists. And they define a recession as a, I think appropriately so, a broad-based, persistent decline in economic activity. Uh, and that's not what's happening here. And you get a sense of that in this first chart, which shows uh, GDP, real GDP, the blue line, and jobs, employment, indexed to equal 100 uh, right before the pandemic hit in February of 2020. And you can see uh, the severity of the downturn when the pandemic hit in March, April of that year. As I mentioned, we lost 22 million jobs. You can see on a monthly basis, this is monthly data from January 2019 through August of this year, uh, GDP fell on a monthly basis almost 15%. That's very severe. I mean, for context, the peak to trough decline in GDP during the financial crisis was closer to 4 or 5%. So, you know, it gives you a sense of magnitude. GDP came out of the gates pretty quickly as the economy reopened back in late 20, early 2021 and has indeed kind of gone sideways here over the past six to 12 months. Uh, but, uh, but jobs, employment, in, in my mind, uh, I think uh, more important uh, gauge of the health of the economy, certainly to the average person, the job, jobs are booming. Uh, we're creating a boatload of jobs, uh, 300,000 plus in August. That's the last data point of uh, an average of, um, of a four four hundred k over the past six months, and over five hundred k per month uh, over the past year. Uh, just for context, we need about a hundred k each month to absorb the growth in the labor force uh, and maintain stable unemployment. So unemployment has steadily declined and is very low, or in the mid threes, consistent with where we were pre-pandemic. Uh, layoffs are about as low as they've ever been. There's been some layoff announcements, you know, in the tech industry. I saw Goldman Sachs announce some layoffs in the mortgage finance industry, but uh, in uh, economy-wide layoffs, we, can, we know this by looking at claims for unemployment insurance, uh, are about as low as they ever get. And in a close to a record number of unfilled open job positions uh, across every industry in almost everywhere in the country, you know, from healthcare to trucking to manufacturing to construction, construction probably on, on less so now given what's going on in, that, in the single family housing market, but it gives you a sense of it. So uh, this is not a recession. Uh, the economy is still uh, growing uh, and growing quite strongly. So answer, the answer to question number one is, uh, are we in recession? The answer is no. Uh, okay, if we're not in a recession, what's the next question, obvious question, well, what about the next 6, uh, 12, 18 months? And here I'll say a couple of things up front. First, uh, that, uh, you know, I'm not nearly as confident in this, answering this question than in the first one. Uh, second, I'm, the reason I'm not confident, nearly as confident is because we do have a problem with inflation. Inflation is a very serious problem. In, in my view, uh, the catalyst for the high inflation is, is largely the pandemic, the disruption to supply chains and to the job market, uh, and the Russian invasion of Ukraine, which caused oil prices, natural gas, ag, ag prices to go skyward. Uh, those are the root causes of the high inflation, but the inflation has been uh, with us now for almost a year, uh, a little over a year now, because of those supply shocks, so-called supply shocks, and that is beginning to affect uh, people's businesses, consumers thinking about future inflation, inflation, so-called inflation expectations. 
has started to rise. Uh, and, you know, once that happened, that's when the Federal Reserve had was forced to go on high alert, sort of jacking up interest rates. So we're in this environment of high inflation. Uh, I'll come back to that in a second. Uh, and um, uh, and um, uh, 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 rising interest rates. And in that environment, you know, recession risks are, are high. So I put recession odds at about even uh, over the next 12, 18 months. So even odds that we'll make our way through, even odds that we'll go into recession. If I had to pick one or the other, I'd still err on the side of no recession, but it's going to be close. But this gets to a third point. You know, regardless of whether we go into recession or not, the next 6, 12, 18 months, and really it's more 12, 18 months than six months, uh, it's going to be a struggle. Uh, the economy's growth is going to indeed slow very sharply. Job growth is going to slow. Unemployment is going to start to notch higher. It's going to feel uh, uncomfortable. Uh, you know, uh, going forward. But let me <clears throat> do two things here. One is give you a sense of why we might not go into recession. I'll give you a couple of reasons for that. And then I'll turn to, well, you know, what are the risks here that we do go in? What could push us in into an economic downturn? So Trish, you can move to the first slide. Reason number one for confidence, some confidence that we'll make our way through without recession is that the American consumer is in very good shape. And it kind of the way I think about it is the consumer is the firewall between an economy that continues to kind of eke out some growth and one that goes into an economic downturn. And that firewall is strong. Lots of jobs, at least in aggregate, uh, lots of jobs, um, low unemployment. And as you can see here, a lot of cash that, and sitting in people's checking accounts uh, built up during the pandemic. Uh, this shows uh, in trillions of dollars uh, the, uh, the uh, size of deposit accounts across the income distribution in three points in time. The blue bar uh, represents uh, the amount of cash sitting in deposit accounts right before the pandemic, the fourth quarter of 2019. That's really December of 2019. The, blue, the green bar is the fourth quarter or December of 2020, so kind of in the teeth of the pandemic before the, before the vaccines got rolled out. And then uh, and a lot of the government support had been provided. <laughs> and then the last data point, the orange bar, is uh, the second quarter of 2022, June of 2022. This is hard data. This is data that the banks have to report to the FDIC and Federal Reserve as part of regulatory requirements. So this is there's no question about the data here. This is, uh, this is accurate data. It will not be revised. Take a look at the cash holdings of folks in the top part of the income distribution, or even the top middle part of the income distribution, you know, there are washing cash uh, sitting, and it's not, you know, it's, it's, it's readily available cash it's sitting in people's checking accounts. Uh, now, uh, folks at the bottom part of the distribution, you can see the bottom quintile of the distribution, the bottom 20%, they are struggling, and they have blown through that excess cash, and that goes to um, you, you know, obviously there are uh, more fragile financial situations, but also the high inflation. They're shelling out a lot more for gasoline and rent and groceries, and that's uh, drawing down their cash, cash savings. Uh, but the folks above that, they're doing very, very well, lots of cash, and that provides a very significant cushion, allows them to draw down that cash if they need to, if things get a little hairy for them, you know, high inflation or if they lose their job or lose hours or lose wages. So a reason to think that consumers are going to hang tough here and continue to power the economy. And I should say the consumer is the engine of growth. Uh, uh, by the way, not only for the United States, uh, but the American consumer is the engine of growth for the entire global economy. Uh, China was playing that role back when the pandemic hit and back in the financial crisis. Uh, but we, the American consumer, is doing that now, and that's that can see that in the gapping out of our trade deficit, where consumers are buying everything produced here and stuff, a lot of stuff produced overseas, and that's one reason why GDP growth was so weak, soft in the first half of the year was that, excuse me, that gapping out of the uh, trade deficit. Leverage is low uh, it, across in, in aggregate. Uh, it's rising again for that low income group. They are borrowing more to help supplement supplement their income. Uh, to um, uh, to uh, offset the effect of inflation, uh, uh, but um, 
uh, but leverage for everyone else is very low. Debt service burden is about as low as they've ever been. Borrowing has been very restrained. Uh, the households have locked in these low rates through refinancing waves over the years. The average coupon on an outstanding mortgage, mortgage is three and a half percent. You know, it's locked in for 10, 15, 20, 25, 30 years. Uh, no problem. Stock prices are down. Uh, I didn't look today, but you know, yet at the end of yesterday, it was a bad day, obviously, down about 20%. Um, but house prices, while they're now starting to roll over and we'll come back in the context of the risks, you know, they're up quite a bit year over year. So the net of all that is people are as wealthy today as they were a year ago and a lot wealthier than they were three, five, 10 years ago. So you add it all up, the consumer feels like it's uh, in, a, uh, in a pretty good place. And again, uh, the consumer is the engine of growth. And as long as they continue to do their part, uh, the economy should remain recession free. Second reason for some optimism that we're going to make our way through without recession, you could go to the next slide, Trish, is I do expect inflation to moderate uh, and to motivate that uh, is this uh, graphic. Uh, this shows consumer price inflation, CPI inflation year over year, monthly from January 2019. You can see where history ends and forecast begins. Uh, I wasn't able to get, uh, this is data through July. The August data point came out yesterday. It was disappointing although it doesn't change the chart uh, to any uh, meaningful degree. <clears throat> and I've decomposed the uh, inflation into that part, which is re uh, related to the higher oil, gasoline prices, energy prices, that's the red part of the bar. Food prices, which is the orange part of the bar, which uh, is also very closely tied to oil prices because Diesel, getting food from the farm or the ranch, the store shelf is a big part of food prices and one of the reasons why it's jumped. And if we get diesel prices in and they're starting to come in, uh, that should help uh, get food inflation back down. And then the purple part of the bar represents uh, supply chain related price increases, mostly around vehicles. As you know, the uh, uh, chip plant shut down in Southeast Asia during the Delta wave of the pandemic about a year ago vehicle manufacturers could, could not get chips. They could not produce cars. Inventories collapsed. Vehicle prices went skyward, both new and used. Uh, used are starting to roll over now, but vehicle, new vehicle prices remain very strong. Um, uh, the blue part of the bar, that's rent, and that's becoming more of an issue. And I'll talk about that in a second. And the green part of the bar, that's everything else. But mostly, uh, and here's a, a bit of a worry, the cost of medical care services. That's very labor intensive. And because of the shortages in the job market I mentioned earlier, particularly in the healthcare industry, wage growth has is picking up quite significantly in the industry. And that's going to get passed through uh, in the form of higher prices for medical care services. But here's the point. That red part of the bar, that orange part of the bar, and that purple part of the bar, that's going to basically go to zero here relatively soon, assuming that the pandemic doesn't go off the rails again in, in uh, here or in, in China, that we, we kind of manage through any additional waves of the uh, pandemic. And that the uh, other assumption <clears throat> is that the Russian invasion of Ukraine doesn't go off the rails uh, and you know doesn't cause oil prices, natural gas prices, ag prices, metals prices to, to jump again. Obviously, a lot of risk around those assumptions, but I think they're you know the most likely assumptions. So if that happens, if those that the red and the orange and the blue go, or excuse me, the purple go, we get inflation down from 8.3 percent to three and a half to four, which isn't across the finish line because you can see we need to get back to the Federal Reserve's inflation target of two and a half. That's what they're pegging monetary policy to. So we've got another point, point and a half to go, but we're going to make a lot of progress here over the next six, nine months. Inflation is going to come in you know, here pretty quickly. And then to get across the finish line, it's going to take longer, probably not until late 23 going in, into 2024. But uh, you know, that does, again, depend on a bunch of assumptions. But uh, if this is the, the way inflation goes uh, going forward, then I, I do think the Fed will be able to kind of gracefully navigate monetary policy, raise interest rates high enough uh, fast enough to slow the job market, slow job growth, get unemployment moving a little higher, get wage growth down, take the steam out of inflation, but not raise rates so high so fast that it undermines the economy. Tricky, and thus the risk, and thus the 50-50, but 
uh, nonetheless, um, uh, you know, I think odds are uh, still in our favor here, or uh, at least uh, slanting the odds in our favor. Okay, uh, obviously a lot of risk here. Uh, you know, what if I'm wrong? What could drive us into recession? You can move to the next slide, uh, Trish. Uh, there are uh, a lot of risks, uh, some of which I've mentioned, some of which I've not. And to just help get your mind around uh, all the risks is this risk matrix. The x-axis, the horizontal axis, uh, is a, uh, the severity of the risk or shock. Uh, yeah, I kind of think of it like a uh, present value of economic loss if the shock or risk occurs. So it accounts for the, the shock and the timing of the shock. If it's sooner rather than later, then it has a higher present value. It, it's further out on the, uh, on the, on the uh, axis. The y-axis, the vertical axis, that's the probability of that, that risk or that shock. Uh, and clearly you wanna be focused on the, sh the risks in the Northeast part of the chart. So high severity, high probability. And I will talk a little bit about uh, Federal Reserve uh, uh, not gracefully managing policy oversteps and pushing us into recession. I'll come back to that in a second. You can see I qualified a, a lot of my views around inflation around the other risk around the pandemic and the Russian invasion. Do you want to call out house prices? I'm going to come back to that and talk about that in a little bit more detail. Uh, you can see commercial real estate prices decline. Um, it, that's a pretty high probability. I, you know, it depends on the property type uh, and where, but I do think the office market uh, is going to come under, is under pressure and going to continue to remain under pressure. I do think remote work is a, uh, here to stay. It's a game changer. But it's going to ebb and it's going to flow. Uh, it's kind of ebbing a little bit now as office towers in the big urban centers in the Northeast Corridor and Chicago and in the West Coast are reopening and, and CEOs are asking their employers, employees to come back. But I don't think there's any going back here. I think uh, workers uh, are going to demand remote work and they're going to succeed because going forward, abstracting from the ups and downs in the economy, the business cycle, the labor market's going to remain very tight. Uh, boomers are retiring. My cohorts retiring on mass, and of course, immigration is uh, very been very weak and likely to remain so for the, for a considerable period. So workers are going to have the upper hand in their negotiations with their employers, and they're going to demand remote work. And you know, there's a lot of hand wringing among CEOs about the productivity effects of remote work, but the mounting evidence. Uh, academic research in this area is showing that is productivity enhancing. Uh, you know, still early days, still collecting data points. You know, the evidence may shift here, but I sense that, that you know there's no going back on remote work, and it is productivity enhancing. The other thing I'd say is it, uh, it will get better over time with, as new technologies develop, new platforms develop. You know, virtual augmented reality begin you know more become more prevalent in the workplace. I think uh, work or work from home, remote work is going to become easier and more productive. And, and on top of that, I do think new companies that are forming, uh, you know, the young people are forming people form their companies in their thirties, like I did back in 1990. Uh, they uh, they uh, they're going to optimize around remote work. They're not going to optimize around an office space. So. I do think the office market has some adjusting here to do, um, mostly in terms of pricing that might result in, in, in some default, uh, but I think it should be modest. The other property types uh, should navigate through more or less reasonably well. Uh, you know, certainly uh, industrial warehouse, fine, no problem. Retail, a little bit more mixed, but you know, the retail sectors retail developers are pretty good and have shown to be quite adept at you know, repurposing space. And by the way, office developers will as well. They'll figure out how to repurpose some into housing because of the shortage there. And can't do that with seven world trade, but you can with a lot of other office properties. So they'll, they'll figure it out. But uh, I do think we're going to see some price weakness, particularly in the big urban centers that I mentioned earlier that are struggling with the uh, with losing people to the re remote work dynamic. Uh, but you can see it's a low severity in terms of its macroeconomic consequence. So yeah, we're going to see some adjustment in the CRE market, uh, some defaults. Uh, bank regulators are tightening down on their CRE portfolios of the banks they regulate, uh, asking for high levels of capitalization from you know large uh, banking institutions. 
but I don't think it's a macroeconomic issue, uh, particularly because it, you know, if it affects the CRE construction and there it should be relatively modest, but if it affects it, those workers are just gonna you know, jump the fence and go work for a multifamily developer uh, where things are booming. Uh, or uh, go work on public infrastructure, given the infrastructure legislation is going to kick into high gear here, you know, as we move into 23 and uh, into 24. Of course, we've got the IRA with all of the uh, kind of infrastructure investment that's involved with that. So it's on the risk matrix, uh, you know, but in, in something to keep on the radar screen, but I don't view it as a, you know, a mortal threat to the, the macroeconomic outlook. You can notice I put climate change on the matrix. I do think that is you know, at this point, given the horizons here, you know, still a, a modest threat, but it should be on the matrix. I do think increasingly institutions are focusing on climate uh, risk as a uh, as something that is both the opportunity, both a challenge and, and an opportunity. Let me just uh, drill down uh, on a couple of these risks. You can go to the next slide, Trish. I mentioned the Federal Reserve misstepping. You know, you get a sense of why this is a concern here. Uh, this shows uh, how badly wrong-footed the Fed was, you know, back at the beginning of the year when they started to raise interest rates. They were very slow uh, to do that, even based on the kind of framework that they use for evaluating what's the appropriate interest rate for them to manage to the, the federal funds rate target. This is the funds rate target, the rate they control monthly January 2019 through the most recent, uh, uh, the most uh, recent data point. Uh, the blue line is the actual funds rate, the effective funds rate. Uh, you know, they give us a range and then they manage to the range. And this shows you the exact funds rate target monthly on a monthly basis. And the green represents the funds rate target that uh, our modeling would suggest is appropriate given the strength of the economy, unemployment, given where inflation is, given where inflation expectations are, given financial conditions. That's the equity prices and credit spreads and the value of the dollar, all the things that affect the transmission of the interest rate into its economic consequences. Uh, so all those things. And you can see, uh, go back to the start of 2022, the funds rate target was still zero. They were at the zero lower bound, but the model says, and this again is based on their framework, so-called reaction function, wanted a funds rate target that was you know, almost two and a half percent. Uh, which is where they are today on the funds rate. The funds rate is now 2.5%. That's the most recent data point. And the model says, no, we should be closer to something closer to 4%, and we need to get there quickly. And of course, that's exactly where the Fed's going. The Fed is going to raise rates about a three-quarter point or maybe even a full point in a, in a week or two when the FOMC meets, and they're going to continue to push up rates until it is 4 to 4 and a quarter percent uh, by early next year. That green line is still migrating higher. Uh, but the broader point here is that they got this wrong. Uh, now, I don't blame them too much because like everyone else, they were surprised by the pandemic. The Delta wave was after the vaccinations and was a surprise. And of course, the Russian invasion wasn't even on anyone's radar screen at the end of last year. So, you know, these things came out of nowhere uh, and, you know, not surprising that they misjudged, but they clearly misjudged and are scrambling. And because they are now scrambling, that raises the risks here. That's why it's so far out on the risk matrix as a threat that they, you know, they, they, they continue to make mistakes and get it wrong. And, you know, either we go into recession very quickly here or they misjudge and we go into a stagflation scenario uh, and ultimately into an economic downturn. The other risk I want to highlight, uh, and you could go to the next slide, Tr Trish, is housing. Uh, the housing market uh, is, as you know, under a lot of stress, and this goes it, what, what night and day, right? And it, it, a year ago, it was booming literally, figuratively through the roof, and now literally, figuratively through the floor, and this goes to the swing in mortgage rates. It goes back to the Feds going on high alert. So a year ago, the, the mortgage rate, the 30-year fixed mortgage rate was at a record low. It was about 2.6%, I believe. Uh, last I looked a day or two ago, it was over 6%, more than a doubling of the, of the mortgage rate. And of course, that's just uh, conflated with the high now how high house prices and completely undermined affordability. Just to give you a sense of that, if I'm the typical homeowner, uh, or excuse me, the typical, typical home buyer, median price 
I'm making the median income, which is about 70K a year. And I'm going to buy the median priced home, which is about 400K a year. And I put 20% down. Of course, no, for very few for some home buyers put down 20%, but let's just go with it. Uh, at the current mortgage rate, the monthly mortgage payment is about $2,000, very close to $2,000. If I go back a year ago at that mortgage rate, and at that, when the, uh, when, uh, uh, the median price was a lot lower, the average monthly mortgage payment was $1,300. So that's a $700 a month increase in monthly payment. Very few for some home buyers can afford that. And so they're locked out. Uh, and that source of demand, which is about a third of the market, has been completely uh, has evaporated. Also, adding to what's going on, investors, uh, the buy to rent investor, you know, was a big part of the market before things fell apart. If you go back to the second quarter of this year, by our calculation, almost one fifth of all home sales, new and existing, were to investors. Uh, a lot of the mom and pop, but increasingly institutional investor. Those investors have gone completely to the sideline. Obviously, they're opportunistic. They're sensing price declines. Why buy now if I'm going to get the same property, you know, uh, uh, 6, 12, 18 months from now at a lower price? And so home sale, so you got the first time buyer out. Of course, the trade up buyers locked in because they've got an average coupon of three and a half percent. And now if they want to buy another home, they got to get a mortgage at six and their mortgage payment is going to jump. So they're kind of locked in. The investors, to the sideline, you add it all up, home sales are cratered. And, and I, that's not too strong a word that, you know, they've fallen off a cliff, new and existing. We're back to kind of levels coming out of the financial crisis and the housing bust over a decade, about a decade ago. And home sales are under a lot of pressure. And you can see, I do expect prices to be very, very soft here. And this is in the baseline, no recession scenario. That's the blue line in the chart to the left. That's HPI, house price growth over the a percent change year ago. And you can see where I expect the price declines to be more serious. Uh, those are the metropolitan areas in red, 400 plus MSAs across the country. Um, uh, Florida's in trouble. Although interestingly enough, Florida's house prices up to this point in time, at least through July, which is the most recent data we have, have held up pretty well. It's really been California that's been taking it on the chin, LA, San Francisco. Uh, we, we, we didn't expect those, uh, those price declines uh, to the same degree. Uh, we may have to revise the chart. But the, the MSAs in the, in the Mountain West, they're getting nailed too at this point. So the markets that were most juiced are getting hit hardest because of the affordability issue and also because of investors. The investors were very large players in the South and in, in the Mountain West. <clears throat> but the risk here is illustrated by those scenarios. Uh, you know, I'm showing you uh, what I expect house price growth to be if we get into scenarios that are more towards to the tail of the distribution, 75 percentile, that means that uh, there's a 25 percent probability things are that uh, things are better than anticipated, 75 percent thing uh, uh, that they're worse. Uh, excuse me, the 75 percent percentile is a, a, a probability that uh, there's a, only 25% uh, probably uh, things are, uh, are going to be better than that or be going to be worse than that. I'm sorry. Uh, and the 96 percentile is a 4% probability that things are going to become be worse than that. So that's kind of out there on the tail of the distribution, the kind of scenario that a bank would use when doing capital planning, like a C-car stress scenario. Uh, so that gives you a sense of you know magnitude here. If we do actually go into some kind of recession, the and uh, you know, the price declines will be more serious. And if that's the case, then we can get into kind of a self-reinforcing negative cycle and the uh, risks here are you know, quite considerable. So obviously uh, a lot of risk around that as well. Okay, uh, finally, let me now turn to the last part of the talk. And that is, well, what should I be looking at you know, to gauge you know, whether we are gonna make our way through and avoid an economic downturn or are we going into recession? And I'm going to mention, there's a lot of, I'd look at all the statistics. Uh, I, I look at all of them, but I, I'll mention three that I think are most prescient, the long lead, intermediate lead, and uh, near-term uh, indicator. First up is what's shown here. It's what I call the policy yield curve. It's the difference between the 10-year treasury yield and the uh, federal funds rate target. And uh, I'm showing you data back to the mid-70s. You can see the recessions. Those are the red shaded bars. And you'll note that every time the policy curve is inverted, the funds rate has risen above the 10-year 
a, res a recession has ensued in, in uh, uh, looking at this over time, on average, somewhere between 12 and 18 months to be precise, it's 15 months in advance. Uh, you, you will note that it does have some false positives. Sometimes the policy yield curve will invert and recession not follow. Uh, so it's not foolproof in that respect, but you, you do need to see a, at least if history is any guide, a, an aversion here before uh, you know, we send off the red flares and uh, uh, all recession alarm bells. And right now the curve, policy curve is tightening uh, the 10 year uh, difference between the 10 year yield and the uh, a funds rate is coming in, but it's still positive. In fact, it's actually widened out a little bit here. The funds rates at two and a half, the 10 year is closing in on three and a half. That's a percentage point. But next week or the week after when the FOMC of the Fed meets, they're going to raise rates three quarters of a point or a point. That, that policy curve is going to narrow. It won't, I don't think, invert. But then the question is with the next rate hike and the one after that and the one after that, will the Fed ultimately push the policy rate above the 10 year? Uh, and that's a real possibility. If that happens, then alarm bells should be going off. Uh, if history is a guide, we're going into recession. Uh, probably not in the next six months, very unlikely given the strength of the labor market, we're going into recession anytime soon. But, but uh, by the second half of 2023, uh, going into 24, recession seems like a likely probability. There's lots of intuition around you know, why this is a good pressure indicator, which I would be happy to respond to if you would like to in the Q&A part of the conversation, which we're coming up to. Second indicator, intermediate term, three, six month lead is consumer competence. Uh, uh, I, I know this looks like a, a, you know, if you know your trigonometry sine waves or, or maybe uh, uh, if, you, if, you, if you play music, it looks like a, some, some wacko music. But uh, the point is that uh, when consumer confidence weakens as measured by the three month change in the uh, conference board's survey of consumer confidence. So when that falls sharply, and you can see here by 20 percentage points, every time that's happened, uh, a recession has ensued relatively soon thereafter. Uh, and the, the intuition here is pretty straightforward. At the end of the day, uh, a recession is a loss of faith. Uh, consumers lose faith that they're going to hold on to their job. They stop spending back to the firewall. They go the metaphor I have in my mind is they run into a bunker and stop spending. They're panicked. Businesses lose faith that they're going to be able to sell whatever it is they produce, and they start laying off workers, and you get into this self-reinforcing negative cycle. Sentiment is weak right now. Uh, it's improved a little bit over the last month or two, given the lower gasoline prices, but it's very weak by historical standards. But what really what matters uh, in terms of recession is the change in. It has to fall sharply, and it has not done that. In fact, on the last three months, it's basically flat. So it's not signaling any potential recession over the next three, six months. And, I, and I, that is, seems very likely to me. But keep your eye on this. Uh, you know, if, it, if you do see consumer confidence as measured by the conference board of start to evaporate, then uh, the recession is coming. You got, a, you got about three to six months to batten down the hatches. Finally, the last indicator I want to mention, short leading indicator, is the change in the unemployment rate. If that rises, the unemployment rate rises by a half a point or more uh, in a three month period on a three month moving average basis, uh, we're going in and we're, we're a month or two away. Uh, businesses have lost faith, they're laying off, consumers are panicked, they are running for the bunker. We're going in. So, uh, and you don't have much at that point. You don't have much lead. Uh, uh, you got a month or two before you know we're in full-blown economic recession. So, hopefully that was uh, that's helpful guidance uh, with regard to what's going on here. Clearly, a very uncertain time. 50-50. I mean, I can make a big case for both. So, very difficult uh, time to be operating uh, in a business environment. Uh, but um, but uh, hopefully you found that of some value. I'll stop right there. I took my 40 minutes and I'll turn it back, I guess, to you, Bo. All right, Mark, I got a few questions for you. And first off to the, uh, to everyone attending, we have, um, you can post your questions into the uh, little board here and your panel through Zoom and I'll see it and I can ask Mark. So, but I do have a few questions that have come in. So first off, um, 
I guess you answer the question about the inverted yield curve. We are not an inverted yield curve, even though it feels like it. Um, but it would seem like we're headed that way. So in the PACE world, it's a very long-term financial, long-term finance instrument. So what's if, and you also mentioned we're going to do a hike after hike after hike. So what's your outlook for long-term rates, would you say, in the next couple of years? Yeah, you know, Bo, uh, forecasting anything is difficult and forecasting long-term interest rates is incredibly intrepid. I will do that for you, only you, Bo, uh, but, <laughs> you know, obviously a lot of risk uh, in that forecasting. And kind of the stake in the ground I have in thinking about where long-term rates should be, that, and when I say that, I mean the 10-year treasury yield as my benchmark, is that in the long run, cutting through the business cycle and the, you know, the uh, 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 vagaries of, uh, of events, the 10-year yield should be equal to the nominal potential growth rate of the economy, nominal GDP growth, which is uh, 4%. Uh, that's 2% real growth and 2% inflation, the Fed's target. Uh, that 4% is, uh, that if you're growing at the nominal potential GDP, if, if your 10-year ten, yield's at four and you're growing at nominal potential growth, your tenure yields like the cost of capital, the nominal potential growth is the return on capital. They need to be roughly equal to each other in uh, a, uh, what economists, a world of equilibrium when you know, you're know you not being affected or buffeted by business cycle effects or other, you know, uh, uh, other factors that are more temporal. Uh, and that's, the, that's actually empirically the case. If you go back and just look at the tenure treasury yield on average over the last 50 years, look at nominal potential GDP growth over the last 50 years, they are exactly equal to each other, the last time I looked, to the basis point. So it works, it, it makes sense in theory, it, it, it works in theory and it, make, and it works out in, in, empirically. So and that's, my, that's the stake. Uh, so we're at three and a half, uh, that says, you know, we should, we're going to four. Uh, now it's never a straight line, you know, you can, get big swings up and down and all around, but uh, I expect to be at 4% here, you know, by early next year. By the way, if that's the case and the funds rate target goes to four and a four, you know, to 4%, then we may not see a policy. We might not see an inversion of this yield curve I'm focused on here, the policy yield curve. Clearly an inversion in the <coughs> year yield versus the two-year yield, but not in the policy yield curve. So it's very possible that we don't see an erosion, and that would be consistent again with the view that we're not going into recession, you know, yeah, a year down the road. But I, for prudent planning, long-term planning, if I were, you know, doing that financial accounting or budgeting, I think I'd put four percent into my spreadsheet, uh, you know, for that calculation. All right, a different All right. world. We're not at we're at that two percent world that we enjoyed pre-pandemic. That's 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 gone. Uh, we're not going back to that. Okay. Another question for you. How does the Inflation Recovery Act impact inflation? That's what I think something a lot of us have, are wondering. So what's your take on the Inflation Recovery Act's impact on inflation? In the near term, it's neither here nor there with regard to inflation. I mean, splitting hairs on the margin, and I've done the work, it, lower, it lowers inflation a little bit and we're talking basis points, you know, so not material. So the, the name Inflation Reduction Act is, a, is, a, is, a, is political. It's not, you know, reality in terms of near-term inflation. It helps a little bit on inflation in, in that, you know, it does lower drug costs, uh, but that's not for a while. You know, that doesn't really take effect until 2025, I believe. And it's a very limited number of drugs that, uh, where the Medicare can, Medicaid can uh, negotiate. So it's on the margin. Also a little bit of benefit in that there's a subsidy for people, low-income households to get on the Affordable Care Act and keep their health insurance premiums down. So a little bit of help there, but these things are small in the grand scheme of things. So maybe a little bit, you know, tilts inflation in the right direction, but, you know, very modest. Obviously, the biggest aspect of the IRA is the climate-related provisions, and they're meaningful. Uh, you know, almost, I think it's $370, 80000000000 billion over 10 years, and 
uh, I do think that does move the dial on uh, CO2 emissions and has some meaningful impact on climate, uh, you know, you know uh, climate or climate efforts, you know, going forward. And I do think that that is important in, in regard to longer term inflation, because I do think, you know, uh, being on fossil fuels, oil, natural gas, coal, uh, is a is very problematic, and you do you see that in the current environment. I mean, the fact that we're you know the world is still Europe and in, in, in particular is still so dependent on fossil fuel is a problem. You know, oil prices have gone skyward, natural gas prices have gone skyward, coal prices have gone skyward, and that's a real that's you know at the heart of the serious inflationary problem that we have because because gasoline oil is still so central to the way people think about their financial uh, well-being in, in terms of what they think about inflation. So I think anything we can do to move to renewables away from fossil fuel, and that's what the IRA is about, will ultimately be very, very therapeutic in terms of the economy's uh, growth, in terms of it, uh, national security, and also in terms of inflation. Uh, so I think it's incredibly positive. You know, obviously it doesn't pay off for, for until uh, long into the future, but climate risk is long into the future. The final thing I'll say is, you know, it is paid for. Uh, you may not like people, some people don't like the way it's paid for, a higher book income tax on large corporations that don't pay tax. That's a complicated tax. It's, you know, it's a bit of a mess. Uh, there's all kinds of potential unintended consequences. So it's not clean, but it is does raise a lot of revenue. And of course, the Medicare prescription drug uh, does, does help, uh, you know, lower uh, deficits in debt. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, so, so it is paid for, and that also means that it's, it, and then some, you know, it lowers deficits and debt by about 300 billion over 10 and about almost 2 trillion over 20, if ever all the provisions remain in place and that's disinflationary, <coughs> you know, all, all else being equal. So, you know, does it deserve the name inflation reduction act? Well, that's a bit of a political sleight of hand, but it's certainly moving in inflation in the right direction and more so in the future than, you know, in the here and now. Okay. Here's a uh, question. Um, as it relates to CRE multifamily, would it be a safe investment for new builds within the next two to three years with higher interest rates and inflation of building products? Uh, I think, multi well, yes, I think multifamily is, uh, it's not going to be as profitable as it has been multifamily development, but it's going to be profitable. Uh, there's insatiable demand. There's a severe shortage. Rent growth is, you know, that may moderate here because, but that's moderating from 15% year over year growth. So suppose we go half that, it's still pretty damn good. If we get in, in the context of getting overall inflation back down to two, 3%. Uh, I do think that building material costs, uh, and labor costs will moderate. There already are to some degree, you know, for some products. Supply chains are going to iron themselves out and, you know, get uh, some of those building materials that are kind of bottled up in the supply chain that's coming through. Prices will come in. So I think it's going to be uh, less expensive than you think uh, in terms of the build, building materials. Uh, of course, interest rates complicate things. You know, it's not quite as attractive. Uh, I will say there is a potential uh, positive from policymakers, a lot of chatter, and we'll have to see if this chatter remains on the other side of the election, around tax incentives for uh, multifamily, you know, low-income multifamily development. LIHTC, you know, would be the poster child, obviously. But neighborhood, neighborhood home tax credits, uh, that's a new tax credit for developing um, uh, uh, old structures. Uh, some talk of more new market tax credits, a lot of interest in, uh, and, I, and I'm on the board of a, a the lead director of a CDFI, so just take a disclosure. I don't know if you mentioned that. Uh, we use a lot of new market tax credits. Uh, so I think there's a lot of interest in that. So there may be some tax benefits coming here shortly well, on the other side of the election. There's a lot of bipartisan support for, for that kind of thing to help support. And I do think I was just speaking at the, uh, I'm here in DC, I was speaking at the National Multifamily Housing Council, NMHC, and uh, uh, there were protesters outside for two days in a row, uh, 
renters are mad. I mean, they are really mad, upset. And I, I get it. You know, rents are rising so rapidly. And people are getting kicked out of homes. And uh, so they're, they're, they're angry. And that, I think, is going to become even angrier as we move on the other side of the election in the next year. And there's going to be a lot of political pressure to address this shortage. So I think there might be some tax benefits at some point here to kind of juice things up with regard to affordable rental, not, you know, not yeah. high end rental. So there's been macro trends for a while driving multifamily. And I haven't checked on that data recently, but it, in this climate, are all those trends still very positive? They are. For- yeah, even more so, right, Bo? Because with the jack, with the surge in fixed mortgage rates, first-time buyers can't buy. Uh, potential first-time home buyers can't buy a home; they're going to rent. So all of a sudden, demand has gotten juiced, and that's one reason why we've seen, um, you know, rent rent grow so strong. And supply, there's you know, fair amount of supply. Five hundred thousand multifamily units per annum is high by historical standards, and I meant there's a record number of homes rental homes, multifamily homes in the pipeline going to completion, bottled up by supply chain issues and labor market issues, but they'll get ironed out. Uh, But even with that, we've got a very severe shortage. The rental vacancy rate, it's not at a record low, but it's pretty damn close to a record low. So the kind of the, the kind of the real fundamentals of the multifamily market look, you know, really good here. Still very good. Okay. All right. Question on bank deposits. So I think there was an article last week in the Wall Street Journal that had a, there's a, it was about specifically a large flight of deposits leaving banks and it had some large number of a, many, many, um, like hundreds of billions of dollars. That's conflicts with the data you showed about like consumer deposits. So is, is uh, are we reading this wrong? But is there like a, a difference between consumer deposits that are very strong, but overall the deposits seem to be departing banks. That's the impression I got from that article. Yeah. What's what's the status of deposits broadly and redemptions, you know, with yeah. banks? I, I, I've heard that some a number of people have brought that piece up to me, that article up to me today, literally today. I've had, you're the third person. So I got to go read that article. I'm not sure, <laughs> you know, it's interesting. Uh, my sense is that the data I showed you was through June and now July, August, and September, inflation is high. So uh, those lower income groups are stressed and they are drawing down those deposits to pay, you know, for their food, their gas, their everything. And that may be part of what's going on. Uh, you would expect deposit, the deposit base to start to come, come back down, right? Because it got all juiced by the uh, savings during the pandemic, partly because of sheltering in place, partly because of all the government support. So that's going to come, come over time, going to come in. And those high income households that have, the bulk of the deposits, you know, they're kind of stuck because they don't know where to put that money. You know, what are you going to do? Put it in the equity market? I don't think so. Are you going to put it into bonds? Are you crazy? Are you going to put it into housing? No, that doesn't feel right. So, you know, you're kind of, it's just sitting there in, the, in your deposit account. You know, maybe you move it around a little bit to get a somewhat higher interest rate, but you're not going to, you're still, you maybe put it into some CDs, but maybe, I don't, you know, so I, I you know, I, I, that's going to come in uh, over time. But, uh, you know, I, I, it's very, very elevated. The other thing that might be going on, uh, and I hear I'm, this is more higher order of speculation, is, is commercial deposits. You know, it could be the case that you got some companies that, you know, uh, are struggling a little bit, starting to struggle a little bit with the higher interest rates, debt payments, that kind of thing. And they may be drawing down commercial deposits. I'll have to take a closer look at that. I will say, you know, the general fear here in the banking community is that, you know, uh, with uh, quantitative tightening, with the Fed drawing down its balance sheet, uh, that's going to pull reserves out of the system, and that's going to cause deposits to fall. And of course, that's a major funding source, particularly for smaller banking institutions, and raise their cost of funding. If history isn't a guide, that's not going to happen. If you because we've been here, right? Go back after the financial crisis, the Fed did the same thing. They stopped queuing. They started quantitative tightening. Let secure treasury and mortgage securities on their balance sheet run off. And we did not see kind of this mass exodus out of, out of deposit accounts. It slowly came back down over time and it was you know relatively graceful. I actually, I did a study, actually a Wells Fargo uh, uh, commissioned a study. And I can say that because it's in the public domain 
on this very issue. So you, I think you can find it. You could probably Google Zandi, Wells Fargo, deposits, and you'll go to that study. And I, I, there was a lot of concern about this back coming out of the financial crisis. And I, that's why I did the study, why Wells Fargo wanted me to do it. And I came away thinking this was not a big deal. Uh, and it wasn't. It wasn't a big deal. So I, it's, my intuition is that same kind of hand wringing is happening right now, but it's, it's misplaced hand wringing. All right. Okay. A couple, couple of follow-up questions. So you spoke about multifamily specifically, but, but, but around hospitality and senior housing, those are two asset types that are important to this audience. So um, what's your take on the outlook for specifically hospitality and senior housing? Uh, you're stretching me a little bit though. Uh, okay. Yeah, I, I will. I will answer in, in the in the spirit of uh, you know some things I'm incompetent, some things not so much. Uh, this is more towards I'm less confident in, very confident in multifamily, pretty confident in office, less confident in hospitality and senior living. On the hospitality side, uh, it feels pretty good right now, uh, but I suspect uh, that ultimately business travel, tourism, no problem. I mean, that's coming roaring back. And I think that just returns to what it was pre-pandemic. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, those high income households with all the cash in the near term, you know, part of what they're going to do is spend it on travel. Uh, business travel, that is coming back. Uh, I, I'm testimonial to that. I'm now traveling. Uh, but I don't see us going back to the way we were. Like, for example, I got invited to speak to a large asset manager in December and I said, uh, you know, happy, ha you know, if you want me to come there, this is the, this is the price it's going to cost you. By the way, uh, no, well, I won't go there. The pr price is going to cost you. And here's the price it's going to cost you if I do a Zoom. And, you know, I'm, I'm guessing I'm going to get more, a lot more Zooms than, than uh, in person just because it's a lot more expensive. So, and, you know, I'm not going to visit my, I've got offices with economists sitting in, uh, London and Prague and Dubai and Singapore and Vancouver and Tokyo and Los Angeles. I'm not going to go, you know, visit them because I see them on Zoom every day. You know, so right. I suspect that's going to be impaired, and so hospitality uh, isn't going to return to pre-pandemic. At least, you know, they'll ultimately adjust. But you know, if your horizon is the next three to five years, uh, I, I think it's going to be somewhat impaired. Senior living. Uh, I mean, the demographics are pretty damn compelling, aren't they? I mean, there's a lot of people like me, you know, <laughs> headed in that direction. Uh, so I, I, I think it doesn't, it, uh, it's not a demand side problem. Uh, you know, the, there's demand, you know, if there's an issue there, it's more around the supply side and financing and, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, I don't see, you know, an issue on the demand side, the demography here, you know, as they say, uh, demography is destiny. And, you know, that, I think that's pretty clear in the senior living space. All right. Well, it looks like we have to catch further stuff on your podcast. As you were talking, by the way, I, I, I became a follower of your inside economics podcast. Excellent. So I, I want to hear, that, I want to hear more. Yeah, we're good. It's fun. It's the funniest thing I do all week. Cause I, I just riff with, you know, two of my colleagues that I've been with forever and we actually debate stuff and think about things that, you know, and, you know, uh, hand ring over things like we sound certain now, but we're not so certain. So we're talking about it. So you I think you'd enjoy it. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, well, thank you so much. This was it's excellent to hear your input. And all of us are grateful. See Pace Alliance. It's, it's a great way to bring our community together. So um, we're very grateful, Mark. Anytime. Yeah, it's my pleasure, Bo. And thanks, everybody. Best of luck with everything. OK, take care. Yeah, now. thank you.